Well, the Ebers are more or less the type of people whose desire is mainly to dominate everybody. If they go to a village, to a town, they want to monopolize everything in that area. I lost a few relations. Um, I had to run away from Lagos because it was, it was not safe. Um, soldiers went to the left to look for me. The 1966 anti-Igbo program was a series of massacres committed against Igbo people and other people of Southern Nigeria origin living in Northern Nigeria starting in May 1956 and reaching a peak after 29 September 1966. Between 8,000 and 30,000 Igbos and Easterners have been estimated to have been killed. A further 1 million Igbos fled in northern region into the east. In response to the killings, some northerners were massacred in Port Harcourt and other eastern cities. These events led to the cessation of the eastern Nigeria region and the declaration of the Republic of Biafra, which ultimately led to the Nigerian Biafran War. The current realities that bedevil the so-called unity of Nigeria or the one Nigeria spirit are unique and logically connected to the foundation of Nigeria itself. It is of course a mere rhetoric to assert that the foundation of Nigeria is inequality and division and it is expected nothing suggestive of unity or togetherness can ever come to be if the basis is not addressed. To justify this fact and possibly make suggest remedies, we shall draw reason from the interview of Sir Amadou Bello, the Sadana of Sokoto, and the God of the North with the BBC journalists back in 1960. Is it Northerners seem to have, I mean, I almost call it obsession about the Ebos. 
Could you perhaps explain that to me? Well, the Igbos are more or less the type of people whose desire is mainly to dominate everybody. If they go to a village, to a town, they want to monopolize everything in that area. If you put them in a labor camp as a laborer, within a year they will try to emerge as headman of that camp, and so on. Well, in, in the past, our people were not alive to their responsibilities, because you can see from our northernization policy that in 1952, when I came here, there weren't 10 northerners in our civil service here. Then I tried to have it northernized, and now all, all important posts are being held by northerners. Is this policy of filling all key posts in the north solely with northerners and not with other Nigerians a temporary or permanent one? In actual fact, what it is, is a northerner first. If you can't get a northerner, then we take an expatriate like yourself on contract. If we can't, then we can employ another Nigerian, but on contract too. This is going to be permanent, I should say, for the, as far as I can foresee, because it will be rather dangerous to see the number of boys who are now turning from our, all our learning institutions, coming out with having no, no work to do. I'm sure whichever government of the day might be, it will feel rather embarrassed, and it might even lead to bloodshed. Doesn't this damage the idea, sir, of uh, all people in all regions in, in Nigeria being fellow citizens of one country? Well, it might, but uh, um, you are, I mean, new to our region, but how many northerners are employed in the east or in the west? The answer is no. And if there are, there may be 10 laborers employed only in the two regions. My fiance is from Wumanachi, not far from here. Your fiance, sir? Yes. Her name is Kainin. You speak Igbo, sir? Wani Dinam. Eh? You speak? In a simple. The My first phase of violence yeah, occurred from May 29 yeah, yeah. to September 29, 1966, when organized killings of Igbo communities took place in northern and western Nigeria. The ancestral land of the Igbo is in eastern Nigeria, but communities lived in northern areas as well. The traditional Nota ethnic communities resented the Igbo from dominating commerce and for their perceived desire to become the new rulers of independent Nigeria. The proximate cause of the first wave of intercommunal violence seems to have been a January 1966 military coup led by a small group of junior Satan and primarily Igbo Nigerian officers which led to the killing of several prominent northern politicians. In the months that followed, ethnically targeted attacks accompanied by mob violence unfolded in three main ways throughout the northern and western regions. The first and third wave targeted Igbo civilians living outside the east. Between those waves, soldiers in July 1966 there was a counter coup during which Igbo officers and men were systematically slaughtered. The extent to which Nigerian state officials organized and coordinated the killings remains disputed. General Yakubu Gowon, named Nigeria head of state, following the counter coup, spoke out against the anti Igbo violence. But the national government failed to assert its authority to effectively end the killings. Though death tolls have not been well documented, it is estimated that a minimum of 3,000 and a maximum of 30,000 Igbos living in northern Nigeria were killed during these attacks. Following the programs in the north, 150,000 to 300,000 Igbos fled to their traditional lands in southern and eastern Nigeria. Shortly following this migration on May 30, 1967, General Mika Ojuku, a young Igbo leader, declared eastern Nigeria to be an independent new state called the Republic of Biafra. 
In response, the Nigerian government initiated the second phase of violence in order to reclaim the region. The first measure taken was an aggressive blockade of the region, which led to a rapid deterioration in living conditions in Biafra. Despite protests from humanitarian agencies, the blockade continued. It is estimated to have caused the death of one million people, largely due to malnutrition and disease. Threatening language from several military leaders raised fear of an imminent genocidal massacre. For example, Mejame Adekule was quoted as saying, we shoot at everything that moves, and when our troops march into the center of Igbo territory, we shoot at everything, even at things that do not move. Believe in the Nigerian government, genocidal objectives became a core tenet of emergent Biafra nationalism. As the war progressed, the Biafran forces seemed destined for defeat. Their territory shrank and armed supplies diminished. Biafran leaders continued to mobilize international humanitarian support due to the atrocity being committed by the Nigerian government, including the man-made famine. Government forces nevertheless continued to express military success. Federal aircraft frequently sheltered Biafra towns and other targets, causing considerable civilian casualties. By mid-1969, Gowon replaced his leading generals, who had previously been afforded a great deal of latitude in waging the war, with men that he considered to be easier to control. The territory held by Biafran leaders continued to shrink. In January 1970, Biafra surrendered. And I would like, therefore, to take this opportunity to say that I, Major General Philip Ethiam, officer administering the government of the Republic of Biafra, now wish to make the following declaration. That we affirm we are loyal Nigerian citizens and accept the authority of the Federal Military Government of Nigeria. That we accept the existing administrative and political structure of the Federation of Nigeria. That any future constitutional arrangement will be worked out by representatives of the people of Nigeria. That the Republic of Biafra hereby seizes to exist. Ending both the conflict and atrocities against the Igbo people, Ujuku fled the country and, and pledged to return and continue the fight for Biafra independence. But he no longer had the necessary political support to make this a reality. Following the end of the conflict, President Gowon proclaimed no victor, no vanquished thereby enabling a relatively peaceful reincorporation of the Igbo into the Nigerian federal state. According to Ahmadi, the Nigerian civil war is the best example of civil war that ended without open post-war recrimination. After the war, the Igbos grew influential although still marginalized and repressed, largely due to the permissible environment of the policy of no victor, no vanquish. The massacres were widely spread in the north and peaked on the 29th May, 29th July, and 29 September 1966. By the time the program ended, virtually all Igbos of the North were dead, hiding among sympathetic Northerners or on their way to the Eastern region. The massacres were led by the Nigeria Army and replicated in various Northern Nigerian cities. 
although Colonel Gowan was issuing guarantees of safety to certain Nigerians living in the north, the intention of a large portion of the Nigerian army at the time was genocidal as was the common racist rhetoric among Thief, Idoma, Hausa and other northern Nigerian tribes. With the exception of few northern Nigerians, mainly army officers who were not convinced that Igbo were initially evil, the southern and eastern Nigerians were generally regarded at the time in the north of Nigeria as described by Charles Kill. Northern Nigerians were, however, also targeted in the Igbo-dominated eastern Nigeria. Thousands of houses, thieves, and other northern tribes were massacred by Igbo mobs, forcing a mass ex exodus of northerners from the eastern region. One factor that led to the hostilities towards southern Nigerians in general and Igbo in particular was the attempt by the Agui Irosi regime to abolish regionalization in favor of a unitary system of government which was regarded as a plot to establish Igbo domination in the Federation. On 24 May 1966, the Ronsi issued a unitary decree which led to an explosion of attacks against the Igbo in northern Nigeria on 29 May 1966. The British press was unanimous in its conviction at the time that these 29 May killings were organized and not spontaneous. The Irosi regime was also perceived to have been favoring southern Nigerians in the appointment to key positions in government, thus heightening the inter-ethnic rivalries. The failure of the Rossi regime to punish the army mutinous responsible for the January 1966 coup further ex exacerbated the situation. The May 1966 program was carried out by rapaging mobs with the connivance of local government. The unprofessional attitude of some elements of the international press are also known to have added to the existing tension. The diplomatic correspondent of the Financial Times had on 17 January 1966 already predicted that the Northerners might already have begun to take revenge for the death of their leader, the Sadana of Sokoto, on the large number of Igbo who live in the North, which at that time they were not doing. This has been criticized as an irresponsible and for a journalist unprofessional self-fulfilling prophecy which would lead the northern elite to assume that the Financial Times was in possession of information that they were not aware of, and that the world expected the North to react in this way. Later tactics were engineered by northern elites to provoke violence such as fabricated news stories submitted to Radio Pontono and relayed by the Hausa service of the BBC detailing exaggerated attacks against Northerners in the East, which led to the furious killings of Eastern Nigerians on 29th September 1966. According to a British newspaper reports at the time, about 30,000 Igbo were killed in September 1966. Why more conservative estimates put the casualties at between 10 and 30,000 for that month. This spree of killings carried on into early October and was carried out by civilians 
sometimes aided by army troops, and swept the entire north. It has been described as the most painful and provocative incident leading to the Nigerian Biafra War. The programs led to the mass movement of Igbo and other Eastern Nigerians back to Eastern Nigeria. It is estimated that more than 1 million Igbos returned to the Eastern region. It also was the precursor to Ojoku's declaration of Eastern Nigerian secession from the Federation as the Republic of Biafra and the resulting Nigerian Civil War 1967 to 1970 which Biafra lost. During the beginning years of Nigeria colonial independence, the Igbo people increasingly were perceived as a disproportionately favored ethnic group with affluence and multi-regionalistic opportunity because of the Igbo had been employed within the colonial Nigeria by the colonial authorities and the public sector in regions throughout the country. This arose the air of orders towards the Igbo. This was emphasized by the short-lived government of General Johnson Agoye Irosi whose military junta consisted mostly of Igbo and who abolished the federated regions. This led to his assassination in a counter coup led primarily by Hausa Fulani participants. It was followed by the massacre of thousands of Igbo in pogroms in the aforementioned region which drove millions of Igbos to their homeland in Eastern region. Ethnic relations deteriorated rapidly, and a separate Republic of Biafra was declared in 1967, leading to the Biafran War. The 1966 anti Igbo program was a series of massacres directed at Igbo and other people of Southern Nigeria origin living in northern Nigeria starting in May 1966 and reaching a peak of peak after 29 September 1966. During this period, 30,000 to 50,000 Igbo civilians were murdered throughout northern Nigeria by Hausa Fulani soldiers and civilians who sought revenge for the 1966 Nigerian coup d'etat carried out by six majors and three captains and resulted in the death of 11 Nigerian politicians and army officers. This event led to the secession of the Eastern Nigeria region and the declaration of the Republic of Biafra, which ultimately led to the Nigeria Biafra War. The 1966 massacres of Southern Nigerians have been described as Holocaust by some authors and have variously been described as riot, pogroms, or genocide. The Republic of Biafra was a secessionist state in eastern Nigeria that existed from 30th May 1967 to January 1970. It took its name from the Bight of Biafra the Atlantic Bay to its south. The inhabitants were mostly the Igbo people who led secession due to economic, ethnic, cultural and religious tensions among the various peoples of Nigeria. Other ethnic groups that constituted the Republic were the Efik, Ibibio, Anang, Ijagham, Eket, Ibeno and Ijo among others.
the fourth in 1966 program, ethnic tension had simmered in Nigeria during discussions of independence, but in the mid 20th century, ethnic and religious riots began to occur. In 1945, an ethnic riot fled up in Jos, in which Hausa Fulani people targeted Igbo people and left many dead and wounded. Police and army units from Kaduna had to be brought in to restore order. At Jos in 1945, a sudden and savage attack by Norton's took the Easterns completely by surprise. So when we talk about folk could realize it, I just had a match in my a very long knife. And they are telling me that as you say, Allah or Kawar, that's what you confess. I'm a Christian. I say I'm a Christian. I should confess that Allah or Kawar. And before the situation could be brought under control, the bodies of Eastern women, men and children litter the streets and their property worth thousands of pounds reduced to shambles. 300 Igbo people died in the Jaws riot. In 1953, a similar riot occurred in Kano later. A decade later, in 1964, and during the Western political crisis, divided the Western region as Ladoke Akintola clashed with Obafemi Awolowo. Widespread reports of fraud tarnished the election's legitimacy. Westerners especially resented the political domination of the Northern People's Congress, many of whose candidates ran unopposed in the election. Violence spread throughout the country and some began to flee the North and West, some to Dahomey. The apparent domination of the political system by the North and the chaos breaking out across the country motivated elements within the military to consider decisive action. The federal government, dominated by Northern Nigeria, allowed the crisis to unfold with the intention of declaring a state of emergency and placing the Western region under martial law. This administration of the Nigerian federal government was widely perceived to be corrupt. In January 1966, the situation reached a breaking point. A military code occurred, during which a mixed but predominantly Igbo group of army officers assassinated 30 political leaders, including Nigeria's Prime Minister Sir Abubakar Tafawa Balewa and the Northern Premier, Sir Amadou Bello. The four most senior officers of Northern origin were also killed. Inamdi Azikiwe, the president of Igbo extraction, and the favored Western region politician were not killed. The commander of the army, General Aguyi Rossi, seized power to maintain order. The programs led to the mass movement of Igbo and other Eastern Nigerians back to Eastern Nigeria. It also was the precursor to Ojuku's declaration of Eastern Nigerian secession from the Federation as the Republic of Biafra and the resulting Nigerian Civil War from 1967 to 1970.